blanks back because they, we pay for these. And she always bugs me if I don't turn them in. So you can have those. And all right, we are moving along. Uh, I'm going to finish up talking about the sensory um, uh, mechanisms today and start talking a little bit about uh, the immune system. Uh, it will be very general uh, as such. Uh, on Friday, uh, which will be our last lecture, um, I have at least three surprises for you. So I hope that you will come um, and partake. Um, some kind of fun stuff. Um, something new, too. So we'll see. The rumble in the crowd. <laughs> the natives are restless here, right? OK. All right, so last time um, I got talking about uh, taste. And uh, taste, of course, uh, the, the uh, uh, sensory uh, system uses taste buds, um, which contain little signaling um, nerve cells uh, that respond to different uh, uh, tastes, as it were. As I mentioned last time, there are five different general categories of taste that we respond to. Uh, and we do have different receptors uh, for those individual ones. But as we'll see, they are sort of clustered together and not kept distinct as are the uh, receptors in smell, for example. So there's a, there's a difference. So taste buds are uh, there. I guess I don't know what else to say about those. They're important. There is a G protein that is involved in signaling some, but not all, taste. Blech. Move that down a little bit. So the G protein that's involved in signaling taste for those uh, nerve cells that use it, that use uh, a G protein, is called GUSDUCIN, G-U-S-T-D-U-C-I-N. And it works by a mechanism not unlike what you saw for uh, smell. So it's a G protein. It's involved in binding GTP, cleaving GTP, stimulating the production of cyclic AMP like we've seen before. But as I said, not all taste um, sensations go through a G protein. The one um, in particular that I'll talk about that does not is the one for uh, sensing salt. And I'll show you how that works. That one actually is kind of simple and, and cute. This uh, shows the localization of the um, uh, goose ducin in the uh, um, uh, s s nerve cells of the taste buds. And uh, it's quite abundant in these cells. There are, um, as I said, multiple receptors for, for example, bitter. And so if we look at the bitters, and they're clustered into, various, uh, into a, a, a single location or a single taste bud, what we see is that there is, uh, again, a decent amount of variation that occurs in there and some conservation. And you see the conservation, again, in blue, where we have sequences that are fairly, uh, kept fairly commonly between uh, the different bitter receptors. Now, different bitter receptors have different things that they respond to, uh, of course. And so that's uh, important for us. It's known, for example, that there is a class of receptors known as T2R. And T2R um, is a bitter receptor. The question is, well, how do you know something is a given type of receptor? And this is one of the ways in which that's been studied. In this case, they have. Um, uh, a, uh, an isolated nerve cell that contains uh, T2R. Uh, and the question is, what, does it what, what signals this particular receptor? And cyclohexamide, which is a very bitter compound, it turns out it's actually a poisonous compound, um, causes the receptor to bind GTP. And that's a very clear indicator, of course, for uh, a G protein mechanism is that when that uh, appropriate molecule binds to the receptor. The receptor causes the G protein, in this case goose ducin, to um, bind GTP. So this is measuring how much GTP is being bound by goose ducin. So we can see in this case, this particular bitter receptor is responding very strongly to cyclohexamide, but it's not responding to other things that are in fact bitter, like qu uh, quinine is, is, is a, a very bitter, uh, a fairly bitter compound but it's not turning on this particular receptor. There are other ways, and I think some very other interesting ways, of um, uh, studying how receptors work. And before I talk about that, I'll, I'll point this out, which I alluded to earlier. And this compares the organization of the receptors of smell versus taste. And what we can see in this is that there is, in fact, localization 
of the um, receptors in olfaction. So here is a class of receptors for a particular chemical in um, uh, detecting things by smell. And they're all localized in the same place. And they go and they signal the same area of the brain. So here's one down here. Again, they have all the orange. And they all point to the same place in the brain. Here's some involved in sensing other chemicals. And they point to other locations in the brain. Now, pointing at different locations in the brain isn't the thing that makes them different. It's the clustering. So you see that all these are clustered as orange. All these are clustered as blue, etc. When we look at taste, we see a mixing of these. So we have a cluster, for example, of sweet sensing things. So there may be several sweet sensing receptors commonly located on a given taste bud. They do go and localize to a specific location in the brain. But I can't tell the difference signal coming from one sweet receptor versus another sweet receptor versus another sweet receptor. And so it's for that reason that we really have a hard time distinguishing different sweet tastes, for example, or different bitter tastes. The overall taste that we get, of course, is a function of that blending that comes when the brain perceives all of these signals and says, OK, this tastes like a steak or whatever. Okay. But um, it's a very different kind of a process than we have associated with smell. OK, that makes sense? Yes, Kevin? OK, that's good. That's what I want to hear. Yes, Kevin? All right. Um, Sweet receptors are very interesting. Um, and it's in the case of sweet receptors, that uh, I want to point out another way of uh, determining what uh, is involved in detecting uh, sweet. In this particular case, um, the uh, way that this was approached was that a research group made a, um, uh, a, a transgenic mouse, and in this case, a knockout mouse. And knockout mouse is a mouse that lacks a certain gene. So in this case, they had made a mouse that lacked uh, the uh, various, uh, there's, there's three different uh, um, uh, uh, sweet receptors that they were studying. They're called T1R1, T1R2, and T1R3. And what they found was that if they knocked out T1R1, they saw, and, and here's how they're studying it. I kind of like this, okay? So in the other case, you've got to go out and you've got to measure GTP, right? And that's a pain. You've got to do all kinds of instruments and so forth. And what you'd really like to know is, well, hey, does this thing uh, influence the ability of this organism to sense this taste? So you take a mouse, OK? And mice like to eat things. And so you have three different mice. One mouse lacks one receptor. Another mouse lacks another receptor. And another mouse lacks yet another receptor, OK? You take these mice and you put them in front of something that's got some, some uh, sweet water in front of it. And the question is, how often do they lick it? Okay? Because if they can sense it and it's sweet, they will keep licking it. Okay? Just like you know, um, uh, drinking a beer or drinking a Coke or whatever. Okay? That's, that positive taste that you get reinforces the behavior and you go on and do it. So all you have to do with these mice then is just take and count how many times the individual mouse licks the thing. Okay? Well, in this case, they see that the only one that really responded like a normal mouse, and the normal's not shown on here, but it's very much like what you see for this guy, is the one that has T2 and, um, uh, and R3. If you have R, uh, T1, R1 with anything, okay, it doesn't bring it up, which tells us that T1, R1 is not overly involved in this sensing this particular sweet uh, component. Okay? Whereas T2 and R3, when together, give, in fact, a very strong signal. The mouse responds to it very tightly, and uh, very, very highly. And the other ones don't give anything at all, or very little at all. So a very cool way of seeing what um, receptor, in fact, is involved in sensing uh, sweet, which I thought was kind of cool. <clears throat> OK. Let's see. Um, the last sense I'll uh, talk about is one called uh, is, is the one that we associate with salty taste. So salt itself, of course, um, gives a salty taste. And um, the salt receptors do not work through a G protein. So they don't work through goose ducin. They work through the movement directly uh, through the um, nerve cell of, of sodium ions. So here's what we have. Here's a channel. I'll come back to that other molecule in a second. Here is a receptor. 
And what we see is it's, got, it, it's buried in the membrane of this nerve cell. And when sodium comes along, this thing changes shape slightly. And it opens up a pore. And guess what comes in through the pore? Sodium. So sodium directly is causing the signaling to happen as a result of changes in the shape of this protein that comes here. When sodium goes away, this guy goes back to its original shape plugs up this thing, and the nerve potential uh, then is, is restored back to its original state. So that's kind of cool. The molecule I showed you on the previous slide actually blocks your ability to sense the taste of salt. Okay? So a milleride actually goes in that little channel that opens up when sodium ions are present, and it blocks it. It blocks the entry of sodium into that channel thereby stopping your ability to sense that, um, that, that uh, salty taste. And a milleride is commonly used to block some sodium channels. Not all sodium channels, but some sodium channels. I'll mention uh, at least one uh, later in the, in the talk today. Okay, so that's the last of what I want to say about the sense of taste. Anything else on taste that you'd like to know or that I can answer questions about? Yes, sir. I have heard of this. There's an unusual fruit that does this, I believe. It's, it's, it has an artificial, uh, artificial, but has an, uh, an unusual um, effect on senses with respect to sweet and sour. Uh, I don't know much about, it, about its mechanism of action, though. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike. I can't tell you that. Yes, Laura. That's correct. The salt channels are completely different than the sodium potassium channels involved in other nerve signaling. And those are general nerve signaling that I've talked about before. Okay. So, kind of a cool mechanism there. The next mechanism is the one that I always find um, a little hard to uh, fathom, and that's vision. Uh, vision is, is really awesome. Um, it is. I hear laughter when I say that. I'm not sure what's funny about that, but vision is really awesome, especially when you think about how fast you have to signal in order to be able to see what you see. If you think about this, you perceive everything in the real world as a continuous process. Okay? And in order for you to do that, you have to be sending accurate signals from every various aspect of your, of your uh, retina back to your brain at about 30 times a second. All right? That's pretty darn cool. All right? uh, and we look at the molecular mechanism of this. This is where I scratch my head and say, wow, that happens 30 times a second. It's pretty hard to fathom, but it works. Well, we think about vision. We think, of course, about um, being able to see things. And the things that we can see in the entire spectrum is relatively small. Okay, so the electromagnetic spectrum goes all the way from radio waves to x-rays. X-rays being the most energetic, radio waves over here being the least energetic. And in the middle of that is the thing that we know as the spectrum. And the spectrum, of course, is what our um, uh, cells in our eyes are able to perceive. And as we shall see, there are uh, specialties that each of them have. The molecule that uh, helps to give us vision, and I shouldn't say helps, it essentially gives us vision. Without this molecule, we don't have vision, uh, is vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiency leads to blindness. And believe it or not, blindness is a real phenomenon in the world uh, where people don't have enough vitamin A in their diets, particularly in poor locations in the world. And blindness happens as a result of that. A very sad and tragic thing in that about a penny a day worth of vitamin A can uh, prevent blindness. Anyway, um, vitamin A is um, a molecule, I've talked about it a little bit before, uh, known as uh, a retinoid. And so retinoids are a class of molecules. The class that's involved in vision is called the aldehyde form. And it's, re it's named as a retinal, R-E-T-I-N-A-L. Retinal, as its name implies, is an aldehyde. You can see the aldehyde bond out here at the end. Other forms of retinoids that are known include retinol, which is an alcohol out there instead of an aldehyde. And retinol is involved in storing vitamin A, most commonly in your liver. So retinol is involved in storage. 
A third form or a third retinoid that's known um, that is uh, quite uh, interesting, particularly as um, eukaryotic organisms are concerned, is the acid form known as retinoic acid. Retinoic acid is um, a form that is uh, very involved in cellular development. It plays a role in some types of cancer and um, is uh, an essential compound for development. Retinoic acid is not stored in your body. So there's not a storage form. There is a storage form of retinol. And retinol can, of course, be released as necessary and oxidized to retinol. So you don't have to eat vitamin A continuously, obviously. And retinol can be oxidized to retinoic acid so that you have it for development. But you can, for example, give a person retinol in their diet, and they will reduce it back to retinol and store it. They will not do that with retinoic acid. It just passes through the system. So uh, it's a transient molecule. Now, the important thing about the retinoids is that they are able to absorb light and change their bonds as a result of that. The bonds that are changed, the most common bond, important bond that's changed is in the, what's called the 11 position. And it has a cis configuration, as you can see here. You recall that from a perspective of chemistry that a cis bond, of course, uh, is a bent bond. We think of the trans bond as basically laying everything out flat. So there's a trans, trans, cis gives us that bend. And then there's another trans down here. Okay? So the bending happens as a result of exposure to light. So if I started with a molecule of retinol that, let's say, was in the 11 cis form, and I expose it to light, one of the things that will happen is that cis bond will be converted back to a trans bond. Okay? That change in configuration changes the geometry of that molecule. So instead of having a bend, we have a molecule that no longer has a bend. That little tiny change in structure is what's responsible for our vision. Okay? So it's a very light sensitive molecule. I used to do, uh, for my master's thesis, I did research on uh, retinoic acid. And the way at that time that we had to do research on retinoic acid was all of our work was done in the dark. Because if we exposed it to light, we ended up making isomers that we didn't want to have in our experiments. So everything had to be done in the dark. And that was an interesting uh, lab experience, I can tell you. OK, now, if we look at um, the way this is configured, it turns out that um, retinol is linked to a protein in the rods and cones of your eye. So I'll talk about those structures in a minute. But you have nerve cells that are rods and cone, called rods and cones in your eye. The rods are responsible for sensing is light present or not present. They don't tell us anything about color. And the cones give different signals depending upon the type of cone that they are and the color of light that they encounter. And I'll say more about those. The important thing from this slide is that in both the rods and the cones, the retinal compound is covalently linked to a protein known as opsin, O-P-S-I-N. Covalently linked to a protein known as opsin. Okay. Now, if we take a look at that protein, what we see is, uh, and by the way, when we make that, that, in fact, here's some rod cells. I think it's a beautiful electron, or elect, uh, scanning electron micrograph image that's there. Um, when we make that linkage between retinol and opsin, we create something called rhodopsin. Okay? So rhodopsin is the product of joining opsin with retinol. And we're starting, in this case, with the 11 cis form of retinol. Okay. If we don't do anything else to it, this is an absorption spectrum that we see. And it's centered pretty much uh, around the visible portion of the spectrum. And in rod cells, that, this is obviously very important. There's that structural change that happens that I described on exposure to light and going from the 11 cis form to the all trans form. And though I think this figure is a little busy, the main point is that this bond here, which is a cis, is becoming a trans. And this part, which is hanging down over here, is lifted up. So we're making a very slight structural change in the retinal component of rhodopsin. 
Well, rhodopsin is a 7TM. You've seen 7TMs before. And the way that this guy is arranged, here's his traditional 7TM. There's a molecule binding to it. We see a structural change happening. In the case of rhodopsin, what's happening is that we're not binding to a molecule. Remember up here, we had to bind to a molecule to get that structural change. The structural change in rhodopsin happens as a result of that change in structure of the retinal. So retinal is going, uh, and this is a dumb figure by the way, is going from this bent form here to this poorly, bent, poorly unbent form over here. That really should be projecting out over this way. But the important thing here is it's changing shape. The molecule is changing shape as a result of exposure to light. And though it doesn't look like it, it's going from the 11 cis form to the all trans form. Now, so we now have a mechanism of converting that um, structure. And by the way, they talk about met rhodop rhodopsin, and there's various intermediate forms of the rhodopsins, and I'm not going to talk about those. I will refer all, to all of them as rhodopsin. Okay? Yes, uh, Megan. I just have sort of an organic chemistry question with the molecule retinol. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, her question is, what keeps it from forming a ring? And it turns out that if you put other double bonds into there, and those, like the, the 11 position is right here. Okay, this is position 7, 9, 11, 13, um, et cetera, out here. It turns out if you expose this molecule to light, these other bonds, for long enough, these other bonds will also isomerize. And when they isomerize, it actually will make a ring. Yeah. Um, in the configuration of rhodopsin, that doesn't typically happen because only one bond is, is typically isomerized. It doesn't get a long enough time to get that exposure to make that ring, but it can do it. Um, and in my laboratory, we were actually the first ones to show that a ring actually does form um, as a result of exposure to light. So it's kind of, kind of a cool thing. Okay. Now, um, Here's what happens during um, the uh, signaling that's happening in exposure to light. So we see, of course, the signal is that light hits this rhodopsin, which is in the membrane. That changes the structure of that 7TM, which is rhodopsin. And that change in structure changes a G protein. No surprise. The G protein is known as transducin. Transducin, you see it labeled there. Transducin drops its GDP, it picks up GTP, and it goes over and it interacts with a phosphodiesterase. You've heard of phosphodiesterases before. One of the things that the phosphodiesterase we talked about last term did was it cleaved cyclic AMP and left AMP. That was important in caffeine, if you recall. This phosphodiesterase works on cyclic GMP. This is happening in your eye. GMP is, I'm sorry, cyclic GMP is being converted to GMP when this guy is active. What effect does that have? Well, cleaving cyclic GMP decreases the concentration of cyclic GMP in here. And since cyclic GMP is a component of this ion channel, when it comes out, nothing goes back in. Okay? When it goes out, nothing comes back in. As a result, the movement of ions, which is already going on freely, in other words, the channel is open, the channel closes. So in this case, instead of letting ions in, we're stopping the movement of ions through the channel. When we stop the movement of ions, that causes a voltage change, and the voltage change starts that nerve signal that ultimately makes its way to our brain. Now, think how fast this is happening. For you to be able to see things, this is going on continuously in your eyes, giving you signals that your brain is using to paint a picture inside of your head. Now, before I get questions, I'll, I'll try to answer them. All right? One of the questions is, closing this guy, that's confusing. Everything else we've talked about involves opening a channel and letting sodium ions in. Why does closing this channel cause a voltage change? Okay? Well, the voltage is maintained fairly constantly by the movement of these ions. If we stop the movement of those ions, the voltage does adjust. 
So it's kind of the backwards way with what we've thought about before with respect to signaling, but the effect is the same. There is a voltage change that happens as a result of this action, and that voltage change ultimately makes its way back to the brain so that we perceive this guy saw light. Okay, now I'll take questions. Everybody's afraid to ask a question after that one. I don't want to ask a question. He just said it. Nobody has any questions? Yes? So does it close the channel rather than um, open it? Is yeah. it basically faster to close the channel and have it transmitted that way? I, I don't know. I'm guessing that that is the case, but, I, but that, that's what you would argue. But again, I, don't, I, I can't tell you. Uh, the fact is, it's, I know it's a very unsatisfying answer for me to give you. It's that way because it works that way. And uh, it definitely works that way. This is a very critical type of signaling that's going on. It's continuous signaling that's going on, certainly when your eyes are open and you're, you're, you're consciously awake. Um, that signaling is going on, and it's not like other signaling that we have. We think about, we talked about smell last time, where your brain adapts to it. You have a signal, signal, signal going on, and eventually your brain says, I'm not paying any more attention to that. Your brain can't do that with eyes. You know? And so it's a different kind of a phenomenon. And I, that's one of the arguments I give for why the signaling in eyes actually is different than it is in other places. Right? It's more a matter of the brain having to pay attention to it. Okay? Um, although the, there are women who say that you know, guys, when they go and they can never find anything, that maybe they really do turn off that signaling in their, in their brains. I don't know. I'm picking on guys a lot, I know. But I'm a guy, so I guess I can do that. But in general, your brain doesn't and can't turn off what's going on. It's coming from your eyes. OK? Yes? You know, that's a good question. I don't know about insect eyes. I mean, certainly they have the, the, the odd shapes and the odd you know, uh, ways that the light enters the eye. But I don't know. I, I would think that the signaling would be very similar to that, but, I, but I, I can't tell you that definitively. OK. So that is what's happening with our eyes. Kind of cool stuff. Now, um, what I've described to you is most commonly associated with rod cells. And rod cells, as I said, are involved in sensing light. Our eyes, I think this is remarkable, okay? A trained eye can be essentially tuned to recognize a single photon, okay? I mean, I think that's, that's just absolutely remarkable that we have the ability to recognize a single photon. Now, what we can't do with those rod cells is we cannot tell color. So the rod cells are tuned to being exquisitely sensitive to photons but not the particular wavelength of photons. The cone cells, on the other hand, are attuned to wavelength, but they're not so sensitive to light in general. This makes sense. If you think about it, you walk at night and it is close to dark outside. You can look and you can see things, but you don't see them in color for the most part. You see them as, I can see a little bit of light over here, I can see a little bit of light over here, but I don't see much in the way of color. To see color requires more light because your cone cells require more photons in order to do that signaling. Now, cone cells also use rhodopsin. I want to emphasize that. They're not fundamentally different. They also use rhodopsin, but they use slightly different forms of rhodopsin such that the absorption maximum that they have varies depending upon the cone cell, that is, which type of rhodopsin that they have. They all use vitamin A. They all use 11 cis vitamin A. But they have slightly different forms of rhodopsin and as a consequence absorb uh, light at maximal wavelengths at different locations. There's the blue, there's the green, there's the red. Okay? This means that we have three sets of cones. We have a green set of cones, we have a red set of cones, and we have a blue set of cones corresponding to the light that they most preferentially absorb. OK. Now, if we look at the green versus the red, we see something very interesting. Green and red receptors are almost identical. The white 
circles here show you identical residues between the human red and the human green receptor. That is the, the, the rhodopsin, okay? So we see almost identity between them. The black marks the things that are different and the purple are similar. So we see red and green really aren't that different from each other and when we see things that aren't very different from each other, we think about either essential function that can't change or we think of something that has recently evolved. And it turns out that this is a recent evolution. Okay? It's a recent evolution. If we compare the sequence of rhodopsins of different organisms, what we see is that human beings are over here. We see sequence-wise that red and green. Red has evolved essentially from the green rev relatively recently in evolutionary history. Okay? The uh, green and blue uh, split from a common ancestor uh, down here. And if we compare it to, let's say, mouse, we see a green and we see a blue, but we don't see a red. Okay? The mouse and dogs, for example, have not gone through and have not had that evolution to create a red receptor. So they don't see red light essentially very well at all. You say, well, how about these chickens over here? People aren't like chickens. Well, notice the evolutionary history of the red of this guy came not from the green, but from way down here. In other words, it's not related to the green at all. It's a different kind of red receptor. Chickens have an ability to see red, and in fact, they can actually see red further in the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum than we can. They actually can see things slightly in the infrared, which we associate with heat. They have a fundamentally different red receptor than we do. Now, this, these receptors being very similar to each other actually cause some problems. The problems are not associated with the fact that their absorption maxima are close. They're not that close. They're reasonably far enough away. But rather, because the sequences that give rise to them are so similar, a phenomenon called recombination can readily happen between them. Because recombination between homologous sequences occurs more, ra more um, commonly between related sequences. Now, another problem associated with this is that the red and green receptors are on the X chromosome. Okay? So when we get recombination, we can, in some cases, um, have, let's say, a, um, uh, a red and a green down here. We get a recombination that can give us uh, an organism that might have this, and so it has one receptor instead of two receptors. It might respond to sort of red, sort of green, but it doesn't have two fundamentally different signals. People who have this would be what's called red-green colorblind. They can't distinguish red from green. And the people who most commonly have these are males because this is on the X chromosome. The males only have one copy of the X chromosome. It's much more likely that they're going to have that recombination occur on that one X chromosome than, it for, than it for it to happen on both X chromosomes, which is what would have to happen for a woman. So that commonality of sequence leads to recombination. Recombination leads to loss of function. And as a consequence, people end up with red-green um, color blindness more commonly if they are male. Questions on that before I go on? Okay, I'm falling behind, but that's okay. Hearing is cool. Also, hearing uh, involves um, little hair cells inside of your ear. And he hearing actually involves mechanical changes. That is, they involve movement. Hearing involves movement. You probably never thought of hearing in that way, but it does. The little tiny bundles of nerve cells that we have inside of our ears get moved by the vibrations happening with a sound wave. So that sound wave is converted into mechanical energy. And it causes slight movements of bundle cells in your ears. And what they do, I think, is nothing short of cool. Here's a bundle cell that I'm talking about. And look how they're sort of arranged this cool sort of twisted uh, system that we see here. 
I'm going to show you a schematic now that shows you why movement is important for the signaling in these ear cells. Okay? This, first of all, shows us that the further that we move that bundle in either direction, one direction or the other direction, the further that we move that guy, we get more of a signal. That makes sense. A louder sound is going to have more energy. It's going to be able to move that, ear, that, that hair cell farther. And as a consequence, we're going to perceive this as a louder noise than otherwise. Okay. Now, how does that translate into a neural signal? Here is a close-up of two of those little rods that were in that, that bundle that I showed you before. And what you see is that the side of one has a little tiny hair linked to the top of the next one. This is an opening for ions to enter. It, enter, it opens only when this movement happens. As this guy moves, it literally opens the door and ions move in. Okay? Ions move in as a result of that movement. Here's a schematic of it. Here's what you saw before. There's the attachment on the side. Here's the, the uh, uh, thing here. Actually, I said it backwards, but the door's on the side, not on the, on the top. But the, the door is being opened as a result of that movement. So here's this guy at a certain place. We get a stimulation, and when the stimulation happens, the door gets pulled open. That can happen going in this direction. That can happen going in this direction. And the net result is once the door is open, ions come in, we see a voltage change, and the signaling going on to the brain occurs as a result of that. Quiet group? Okay. I wish I had a joke. I don't. All right. The last sense I'm going to talk about, and I'll finish the lecture with that today, uh, is touch. Touch is um, related in some ways to our sense of taste, amazingly enough. So, um, for example, one of the, some of the, the, the sensory things that we feel can actually be blocked by that amylaride that we saw associated with the sodium channel. Some types of the sensation of touch can be blocked by that. Okay, Not all, but some. Another thing that we see is that something that absolutely stimulates our sense of taste also has an effect on our sense of touch. And this is a compound called capsaicin. Capsaicin is the hot part of hot pepper. Okay. The hot part of hot pepper. Why is a pepper hot? A pepper is hot because it has a lot of capsaicin, and what capsaicin does is it opens up, it opens up nerve cells in your tongue and lets calcium ions in. The more capsaicin, the more calcium ions, and the more you perceive it as a sense, it is like a sense of touch. In fact, if you think about it, you think about what you associated with hot in your mouth. It's definitely a physical feeling, right? Got to get rid of this thing. What you discover is when you have a lot of capsaicin in your mouth, I love to go to Bombs Away. Anybody else here like to go to Bombs Away? Yeah. Go to Bombs Away and have their Diablo uh, sauce, OK? That stuff is loaded with capsaicin. And what you discover if you have Diablo sauce at Bombs Away is that you take a glass of water, glass of water, glass of water, glass of water, it doesn't do any good. Why doesn't it do any good? Well, let's look at the molecular structure of this guy. Huh, not very polar. I wonder if this guy might get stuck in my membranes and be associated with them for a while and, in fact, continue signaling process. Absolutely. If you want to get hot out of your mouth, one of the best things that you can probably do is drink milk. There are nonpolar compounds in milk that will help extract it from the membranes and get it away so that you um, don't um, get that feeling. If you like spicy Indian food, like I like spicy Indian food, and I love spicy food, again, we're talking about capsaicin. One of the things that we can have to, to, to deal with with that is if you look at Indian meals, they frequently will have yogurt associated with them. Yogurt, again, helps to cool because it's helping to extract this stuff out of your membranes 
and uh, allow uh, that capsaicin to be taken away. Now, the sense of touch, as I said in class earlier, is we know the least about the sense of touch as we do of any of the senses, and it's an active area of investigation. People are very interested in understanding what happens with these. Capsaicin can affect our ability or the, the ability of our touch neurons to, or touch nerves to um, signal. So much so that for certain types of uh, arthritis where there's a lot of pain associated with it, that capsaicin is actually used to treat it because what it does is it overloads the system. And when it overloads the system, the, the brain quits paying attention to it. In a way that regular pain doesn't do that. And I can't tell you why that's the case, but it does. Capsaicin is used to treat various types of arthritis. When we think about the sense of touch, there are different elements to the sense of touch. They, re they refer to pressure, how hard you push on something. They relate to uh, pH. You put your finger in a very acidic solution, you're going to get a burning sensation after a while. They relate to temperature. Okay? And in some cases, these things can add up. So if you have your finger, let's say, in a solution of acid, and this solution of acid is a little bit warm, you're going to get it real quick. Okay? Um, so they add up. All right. That, I think, is the last of what I want to say uh, with touch. And so you guys are ready to go, so I'll let you go. And see you. Don't forget, three surprises on Friday. I, yeah, come by my office. Speaking of touch. Yeah, speaking of touch. You do. You're, you have pain receptors associated in, in your tongue as well. So this is interacting with those pain receptors? Yep. Yes. Uh, when are you going to be in your office? I'm going back there right now. Oh, you are? Yeah. Okay. You going for a card? Yeah. yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. Anyway, so you have pain receptors on your tongue. Yeah. And in, if you think about it, you also get it in your mouth where you don't have any, any taste receptors at all. Right. It kind of diffuses. Your membranes, your membranes are loaded with those things. Uh, in my office. Yeah. So I can tell who comes to class by seeing who needs to pick up milk carts.